Good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Duraff, and I serve with Resonate Global Mission. I serve as the director of our North America regional teams, and so supporting our work of church planting and uh, supporting uh, campus ministries and work with established churches in Canada and the U.S. I'm really glad to have this opportunity to be with you this morning in this way. The scripture I want to share with you and spend some reflecting on with you comes from Acts chapter 8. And if you have a Bible and want to turn with me to Acts chapter 8, I'll be reading the first eight verses. The context of this passage is that back in Acts 1, uh, when Jesus was finished his ministry, he gathered his followers around him and told them that he was going to give them the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he said, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. As we move through the book of Acts, we see that Luke, who wrote Acts, follows that geography. And in Acts 8, uh, we see the movement of the good news of Jesus going from Jerusalem to Judea and then specifically Samaria. And what I want to chat about with you this morning and spend some time reflecting on is what it took to get the gospel out of Jerusalem into Samaria. And I believe that what God did then, he's still doing today in terms of his church and maybe even especially today in the times in which we live. So we come to Acts chapter 8. The deacon uh, Stephen has just been martyred uh, for confessing his faith in Jesus and witnessing to Jesus. And so when we get to Acts 8, this is a time of deep sadness and fear uh, for the Christians in Jerusalem, those first Christians. We read in Acts 8, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church, church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. This is a remarkable story. And as we reflect on it, I want to invite you to pay attention to two key things that are going on in this particular passage. Uh, The first is that there's this scattering of the church that happens. And so we'll talk about that. And the second is the place to where the church is scattered, which is to Samaria. So let's talk about the scattering first, what it means to be displaced. I invite you to think about a time in your life when you felt like you were displaced, when you wondered, like, how did this happen? How did I end up in this spot right now? You wake up and you can't believe um, that you're in this new situation. Some of it can be really good things that happen, uh, a new job or a new opportunity or a move to a new place, a new beginning of some kind. Um, the start of something. Oftentimes this happens, the sense of being displaced often happens, unfortunately, through tragedy, through uh, the loss of a loved one, through the loss of a job, some kind of big change in your family or the world around you where you get uprooted or your world feels like it's been turned upside down. Our church a few years ago uh, here in in Burlington, Ontario, sponsored a family. And uh, this family was from Africa, uh, Central Africa. They lived in a in a camp for 17 years and uh, they had a a number of children that were born in that camp. And, And so our church sponsored them as as refugees into our country. It was a, just a wonderful experience, a wonderful family. But I remember that first night, my wife and I going to visit them to see how they were doing and they needed some groceries. And so we said, of course, we'll go get, pick up some things for you. And we took their two uh, young boys, probably about eight or nine years old with us. And so we walked into a close by grocery store and it was, it was kind of a nice one. It's one of those grocery stores you walk in, all the fruits and vegetables are all laid out beautifully, you know, piled in pyramids or wonderfully displayed. The lighting was fantastic. 
And I, I'll never forget the just the faces on these two boys as they walked into this abundance on display and just their looks around them as they just kind of looked around the store at everything that was there that they'd never seen in their lives having lived in this uh, particular refugee camp where they came from. This family coming from that place, um, coming into Canada in March in a cold and wet climate, um, into a new house with new ways of doing things, new food, new smells, everything uh, was completely overwhelming. And this is an experience that is true for so many people in our world today in different ways. And this is what is happening in the lives of the early Christians. The, in chapter 7, with the death of, of Stephen, their friend, their colleague, someone who they deeply respected and, and were close to, with his death, persecution grows against all of the Christians. And most, most of them are forced to flee from Jerusalem, we're told. And the word that Luke uses to describe them leaving, he says they're scattered. And the, and the word scatter is the Greek word diaspiro from which we get our word in English, we still use it today, is diaspora. This is the word that we use to describe all people groups that are forced from their homes or their homelands, immigrants, migrants, refugees who make their homes in a new and safer place are what we call diaspora communities. These are displaced peoples. And so these first believers become the first diaspora Christians. And Luke tells us in 8.1 that many of them scatter to Judea and to Samaria. And as we read that, we go, aha, what Jesus said back in Acts 1 is coming true. And one of the people who goes to Samaria is the deacon Philip. And as he and his friends go to this place, they're not alone, of course. Uh, God goes with them. And these diaspora Christians, as they go into this new place, have some really powerful experiences in the city they enter. Luke tells us as they go into this place, they do two things. The first is they preach the gospel. And the second thing we're told is that Philip is able to perform miracles in the city. And the result is really clear. The citizens of the city, as they meet these Christians coming in, experience the love and the power of God. Many of them find healing in their lives. Many of them find a spiritual freedom. Luke tells us that with, with shrieks, impure spirits come out of some of them. And, and the end result of this, this powerful presence of God coming in through these early Christians is that great joy fills this city. The whole city is impacted. And this is what I want us to be present to as we think about the story and the dynamics that are here is that the great joy that came into the city of Samaria would not have been possible had it not been for the persecution that had taken place and was taking place in Jerusalem. This deeply painful event, the killing of their friend and their colleague Stephen, forces these Christians out of the comforts of this place they know, of their homes, and scatters them to places that they never would have gone on their own. And this is what leads to the spread of the gospel. As we keep reading in the book of Acts, if you come to Acts chapter 11, specifically in verse 9, we read that the death of Stephen leads to this scattering that actually even goes beyond Samaria and right out into the whole of the Roman Empire. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. These displaced Jerusalem Christians become the start of the church around the world. And we are inheritors of that faithfulness and that transmission of faith from generation to generation. So we have this scattering. That's the first thing we notice. And that scattering leads to the spread of the gospel. The second aspect of the passage that I want to point out is the particular place where these Christians end up. And that is into the city of Samaria. This is what I'm pretty sure I know as I read this story, as I did a little bit of reading into the background of it, is that the deacon Philip likely did not wake up one morning and say, you know what? 
I'm going to head over to Samaria and see what's going on. In fact, I think we can almost guarantee that he had never even been in the city of Samaria before, even though it was only like 65 kilometers or maybe 40 miles from Jerusalem. In studying this passage, I I learned something that I didn't expect. I, I, I had never really thought before about what it was like for Philip and his friends to go into the city of Samaria. I didn't realize how uncomfortable it was for them to be there. I knew that Samaria, of course, was, was the region where the Samaritans lived, this ancient sect that was despised by the Jews and who, who the, the, uh, the Samaritans despised the Jews just as much. I knew that Jesus held a special place in his heart for the Samaritans. He went several times there in his ministry and he dragged his disciples along to follow him. That's where he meets the woman in the well, at the well in, in John chapter 6. Um, He tells, of course, his famous story of the Good Samaritan. That was a little scandalous. So that's what I expected. I expected the kind of religious discomfort that the disciples felt when they followed Jesus into the region of Samaria. What I learned, however, is that within the region of Samaria is the city of Samaria. And that turns out to have been one of the most depraved cities in all of the country of Israel at the time. The city of Samaria had this very long and even pagan kind of history. Just before the time of Jesus, King Herod, who was the Roman ruler at the time, he rebuilt the city and he renamed it Sebaste. And he built this huge temple in the city to honor his own patron, his own leader, Caesar Augustus. So by the time that Jesus was doing his ministry and then the time of the early church, this was a Roman city with Roman gods and shaped around Roman culture and practices. You get a sense of kind of the character of the city. If you keep reading in chapter 8, when the apostle Peter and John arrive and they're confronted by a sorcerer named Simon. You're going, what, what is going on in this city that like sorcerers are going around doing their thing? So there's something about this city that's kind of unique. So in terms of finding a place where they could be sure that their Jewish persecutors would never follow them, The city of Samaria was as safe as could be. Religious Jews like Saul, who who was following and, and persecuting those early Christians, he would never in a million years have gone there. They wouldn't want to be near the Samaritans who lived in the region, and they would never have wanted to enter this particularly Roman and even pagan city called Samaria. Now what Luke is doing here, of course, is he's setting up the drama of the story. Of all places, when the Holy Spirit scatters Philip and his friends from Jerusalem, this is where he sends them. And lo and behold, it turns out God loves the people of Samaria. And as these Samarians encounter the living Jesus in the teaching and in the presence of these Christians, they they accept him into their lives. The event is so remarkable and when Peter and John hear about this back in Jerusalem, they insist on traveling to Samaria themselves to see what's going on. They couldn't believe the incredible work that God was doing. And this then becomes proof, again, of the power of God because of the resurrection of Jesus. Even the Samarians believe. Like, this is amazing. When Jesus told his disciples sometime back that the gospel would go to Samaria, it's part of his plan. The Christians had no idea how this was going to happen. (laughs) They would have wondered how in the world. But God had a plan. And through the ministry of Stephen, through the persecution that follows through the faithfulness of Philip and his companions, the Christians end up in Samaria. They didn't have a plan, but God had a plan. And they're following God's plan, his agenda. So here in these, this very short section of the book of Acts, the start of Acts chapter 8, uh, we learn about this diaspora. We learn of the scattering of the early Christians, and we learn about this place to which they're scattered to, Samaria. Now, what do we make of this? How does this apply for us? Well, let's think about our scattering for a moment. What, is, what does that mean? I think what we can't deny is that through circumstances bigger than ourselves, the church in the West 
finds itself in a strange and a foreign place. I would even say that we find ourselves in a time of displacement. It doesn't mean we're overly uh, persecuted. We have sisters and brothers uh, who work and who live in other parts of the world who suffer deeply for their commitment to Jesus. I know that because we have colleagues in Resonate who minister in some of these places. So I don't want to put anything that we experience here in the West on par with their brothers and sisters who directly suffer because they are Christian. But that being said, the place of our church, of the church in our culture has undergone a really dramatic shift in, the, in, the, in this last generation. We live in a shifting uh, cultural climate with immigration. The world has come to the West, both in Canada and the U.S. And so we find many different religious expressions alive all around us. We see growing political divides how the church has caught up, been caught up in those divides and the way that that has, in a sense, even scattered us from each other in some way, uh, ways. We've, we're becoming increasingly aware of racial injustice and even the ways that the church has contributed to that injustice. As I'm sharing this with you uh, right now, on uh, this week, uh, I live here in Canada and the church is really coming to a reckoning of our residential schools where many indigenous children just really suffered and the discovery of of nearly 200 graves just in the past couple of weeks of children who died alone and far from their parents. Some of the ways that the church has operated was well-meaning. Sometimes it was self-serving or blind. Sometimes it was cruel. But there's a reckoning that that's happening in terms of the church's place in our culture. And now you add the experience of COVID to all of this as we begin to just reflect on and and deal with all the lessons that have come out of this time of COVID, where our personal experience of what church is has been dramatically different, uh, all the way from how we experience Sunday worship to the running of our programs, to the experience of what it means to be community together, all of that we've had to think about more deeply. And what I really believe is that through all of this, the Holy Spirit may be pushing us out of the familiar and out of the comfortable into an experience of displacement. We might describe it as a dislocation or a sense of exile, or to use Luke's words, a kind of scattering. And it raises a lot of questions. Where are we? How did we get here? What do we do next? Will the church survive? If it does survive, what will it look like? So my question is, if we're feeling a little scattered, what does this passage tell us about how to respond to our scattering? And what I see is that even though Philip had no idea that he would end up in Samaria, he went knowing that even in this place there was ministry to do. For Philip and his Christians, fellow Christians with them, they were committed to serving God wherever he led them. And so even here, far from home, running for, from their, for their lives, they would tell the story of Jesus. They would pray for hurting people. They believed that God could change any life. And do we believe that? Are we committed to that? Do we believe that in this time, God calls us to a new ministry? If there's lessons to be learned from the scattering, what's our Samaria? We've thought about that in Resonate, and we describe Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth in the following ways. We say that our Jerusalem represents the people that are in our community, our fellow Christians. Our Judea represents the people that are geographically close to us and culturally near to us. They may be similar. They may not be Christians, but we share similar ethnic and cultural backgrounds. So neighbors and coworkers, people we play sports with or do art stuff with, the, the, those we, the people we naturally connect with might be considered our Judea. Our Samaria then would be those people who are geographically near, but culturally far from us, different from us. And Jesus is reminding us, I think, in Acts 8, that our ministry is not just for people who we're comfortable with or who look like us, but that the Holy Spirit's work in us leads us to ministry that just naturally pushes us out of our comfort zone and challenges us to cross 
cultural, and ethnic boundaries. So for me in Burlington, where I live, or wherever it is that you live and hearing this, we know that people from around the world live in our backyards. So Jesus' command to be witness, uh, be his witnesses in Samaria isn't just theory for us. It's a real calling for the church today. How do we truly engage and love all the neighbors who are around us? We're living in a time of big change and we all get anxious when things, that, when things change. But do we believe that what has not changed is that Jesus is still at work today and that we're called to the ministry of Jesus? Do we still believe that we're called to love all people, called to lives of deep prayer? Do we believe that God can do great things in action, anxious times? Do we believe that no matter how things turn out, that God is orchestrating something new, possibly even better for his church? I think we're invited to a, a new imagination in this time. And as we look in the scriptures, we see that God, through his Holy Spirit, equips his people to live into that new imagination and to follow his spirit into places we may not normally go on our own, but he's already at work in invites us to join him. May God bless each of us in our journey as we seek to be faithful, to love people, to pray for them, and to trust God to do his work.